Thank you very much for staying. Welcome back. Now, Minister for Agri, Dr. Efi Yakutu, says government will announce a date the ban on export of vegetables to the EU market would be lifted this November. This follows a review by a delegation from the EU last September. The minister made this known at the Graphic Business Cambic Bank Business Breakfast meeting in Accra. Yeah, we are encouraging the farmers. You know, we have uh, a financial arrangement with them by telling them that they can take away the, the seeds and the fertilizers uh, at half price and come and pay the difference after the harvest. It means that we put some trust in the farmers. And uh, but the beneficiaries are seeing the effect in terms of the high yields that they are producing their crops at. It means that efficiency has gone up and that should be enough incentive for them to be able to uh, pay the difference so that they can benefit again next year from the same scheme. Planting for food and jobs, how far uh, are we set? Are we, is, it, is it in progress? Is it in motion? Of course it is in progress. It is in progress and the results are, are being uh, showing are very, very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. Especially if you go to Upper West, Upper East, Northern regions. I mean, they are, are the ones who actually took the program to heart in spite of the lateness of, of this coming and so on. Uh, they are Two, two months, you know, they start their planting in June, while their counterparts in the forest areas start theirs in April. So they you say that they had a handicap. And they took full advantage of it, and you can see driving from Tamale to Salaga, from Borga to Tamale, and all that, that it's on the roadside, the evidence is very clear. It's been a big crop, and we are preparing to receive this crop, ensuring that the crop has a zero tolerance for uh, any losses at the Minister, during that discussion, one thing that also came up was that government should concentrate on the policy formulation and allow private sector to, to do the groundwork. Yes. What has been done in this direction yes. to ensure that? But that's, a, that's a philosophy of the NPP government. I mean, we, our party was formed in 1947 and it was a, a right of centre party then and up to today, we believe the private sector are the engines of growth. They are the ones to deliver. Government is there to regulate and uh, uh, provide the environment for a private sector to deliver, and that's exactly what is happening uh, with our... You spoke about the vegetable issue, and the, the economists will always say all other things being equal. Are we going to see the ban possibly being lifted by the close of this year? Oh, definitely. No, maybe in the next one month. It will be, they've indicated to us unofficially that everything is okay now. Are, we put in so much effort in the nine months to correct all those uh, things that were really uh, hampering the progress in the lifting of the ban. We've, we've put reforms in place, we've changed personnel, we've infused new uh, qualified personnel into the system at the, uh, at the ports and in the country, around the country. So now we are confident that we have a sustainable system to ensure good quality uh, uh, products to the European market. And for you, what would this mean, getting back the recognition? Means, yes, yes. That, what would that mean to us? It's, it's, not, it's not the recognition, it's the economic impact. You know, we they stopped us when those items uh, we had, were doing about $18 million a year. If two years from now they, have, uh, they are lifting the ban, we are hoping quickly to go to $18 million and, and take the vegetable subsector up to new, uh, new levels to, for it to make its contribution to the economy of this country. You talked about the Marshall Plan, and we understand how agriculture will make a significant role or will take the lead role in next year's budget. How far have we come with these policies and how will they be implemented? Oh, there's a workshop coming that where all stakeholders are going to be invited in the next uh, uh, 10 days to come together to give their views and their input into the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan is going to be a big infusion of capital into the sector, into the infrastructure. We're talking about roads leading to uh, uh, very fertile lands which are not being, which are being underutilized. We are talking about transferring water from the rivers of the Volta across to uh, valleys, uh, to areas that uh, would help with irrigation. We are talking about big, big things. Meanwhile, other speakers also called on government to prioritize medium to large scale farming should the aim of food security be achieved. Agriculturist Dr. Abu Sakara says using mechanisms, such mechanisms, would improve food sustainability in the sector. Uh, we know that uh, we have challenges, or sometimes we call them 
impediments, sometimes we call them problems, but whatever they are, they're stopping us from getting to where we want to be. And these key challenges uh, are basically in four key areas. Uh, the first is financial investments in agriculture. The second is human resources. The third, of course, is to do with productivity, which is related to uh, infrastructure and transaction costs, etc. And then we have markets, the demand pool of markets and how they affect invest investments as a whole. And of course, the policy environment that molds that. So it stands to reason that if we have all these challenges and we have talked about them for so long, and we have recommendations, several recommendations on what to do about it, what we lack is effective implementation of the solutions of the right kind that are relevant, realistic, and give results. In this regard, the context of implementation is important. And living on the mountaintop is not the same thing as climbing to the mountaintop. If you live on a mountaintop, your issues are different. If you're climbing to the mountaintop, your issues are different. And we need to see the context of how we transform our economy in this regard. I think we must first ask the difficult questions to help us point the way to more effective implementation of strategies and programs that aim to secure the economy through agricultural transformation or modernization, if you want. Is our agriculture for survival or just striving? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. If we want to transform the economy through agriculture, is that going to be the kind of agriculture which is just survival? Or is it actually going to be a thriving agriculture? Of course, it has to be a thriving agriculture, which means our approach to it must be different. Will the farmers continue to be the same? Of course not. We cannot continue on the basis of having only small-scale farmers. There has to be that evolution from small to medium and large-scale commercial farmers. If that evolution is not taking place, then the transformation is not taking place. And that also determines how much we invest in each category of farmer. I think sometimes we focus only on the small-scale farmers to the exclusion of the medium and large commercial-scale farmers. Now on its part, General Secretary of the GAN, General Agricultural Workers Union, GAU, Edward Karawe, is calling for a national policy on best ways for creating a ready market for farmers. There's also limited market access and what I will call fictitious market access. Production is a function of market. Nobody produces when you don't know where you are going to sell it. You either produce for consumption, you produce for the market, or you produce for both consumption and the market. So if you look at our policies today, Planting for food and jobs is a production-based policy or program. Because even if we say it's a policy for some of us, we have not seen the scope of the policy, the content of the policy. We have only been heard or been hearing what the policy looks like. Because I cannot, I've not yet cited, of course, given where I am, maybe the journalists and other people may have it that this is a concrete document that we can take to critique. Away now from the graphic uh, business and uh, a great meeting held today in Accra. Now to the, some energy stories. Deputy Minister for Energy, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, is calling on Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies, MMDAs, to stop commercial and private developers from building close to petroleum and LPG filling stations. Dr. Adam believes it is unfair to ask such stations to relocate in cases where they were built before any other developments in the immediate vicinity. Depu the Deputy Minister was speaking at the launch of a safety campaign by the National Petroleum Authority. And the assessment will also cover operations and general management of the facility. All staff within the facility should demonstrate adequate knowledge of handling LPG and the standard operating procedures. After all is done, high risk stations will be closed down while low risk stations will be designated for the supply 
of gas for vehicles with improved safety standards. Mr. Chairman, as you are aware, Cabinet has approved the introduction of the cylinder recirculation model, the LPG distribution, where individuals like you and I will no longer own LPG cylinders. The authority is currently developing the implementation strategy of the model, which will be rolled out within one year as directed by the President. In the coming weeks, the authority will publish the licensing requirements for setting up LPG bottling plants, which happens to be the new um, case in the maze. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the NPA, as a regulator of the petroleum downstream industry, expects that the public understands the risks and dangers of not using petroleum products safely and discouraging any unconventional use of products without seeking expert advice. We therefore urge the general public to adhere to safety precautions being propagated in all the media outlets that we are currently doing. Please note that safety is a shared responsibility and is the first responsibility of the operator of any LPG or liquid station. Indeed, the responsibility of maintenance of safety at various installations in a lot of places in the world where we have best practice remains the responsibility of the owner. Because when you breach safety protocols, the first casualty is likely to be you yourself. And that was rather the CEO of the National Petroleum Authority, Hassan Tampuni. We now go over to the Deputy Minister for Energy, Dr. Amin Adam, who is calling on the Metropolitan Municipal and Mi Metropolitan Municipal and Development Agencies to observe all the safety standards. The recent petroleum-related explosions should remind us vividly about the enormity of our responsibility. Mr. Chairman, in spite of the dangers of poor safety and regulatory regimes, our regulators continue to allow special interests to undermine their enforcement of safety regulations, putting the lives of people and property on the line, and consequently projecting the petroleum industry as most insensitive irresponsible and only motivated by profits. Ladies and gentlemen, we must act now. Mr. Chairman, industry players also tend to view regulators as unnecessarily worrying them and in many instances have ignored regulatory directives. Industry players must therefore live up to their responsibility of protecting the very people who buy their products and patronize their services. I would therefore like to encourage industry players to take the bold step of formulating industry safety standards through industry associations and begin to peer review each other and where necessary, delist your peers who are not keeping up to the standards you have set for yourselves. This will not only complement the role of our regulators, but will embolden them to take decisive disciplinary actions against offending industry players based on your own recommendations. I would also like to caution the general public. Let's still stay in energy, and it is believed to cost the ESLA PLC a lot in terms of total interest payments to fully settle the seven-year energy bond raised. Joy Business calculations shows that it would cost the company created to manage debts in the sector some 2.7 billion CDs in interest payments. A breakdown of the payments showed that it would be paying investors about 456 million CDs every year over the next five-year period. The amount is expected to reduce marginally in the last two years. This would result in a total payment of 5.1 billion CDs by 2024. We will bring you more on this in a subsequent bulletin. Meanwhile, government has been dealing or detailing how it intends to prevent the energy sector from being saddled with huge debt again. This was after it raised part of the 6 billion CD target 
in two separate bonds. George, we have has more. These measures were contained in documents sent to investors ahead of the energy bond sale. Some of the programs could be fully implemented before the close of this year. These include installing prepaid meters at all the ministries, departments and agencies by the close of this year. This would deal with the challenges where most of these agencies fail to pay their bills, resulting in huge debts over a period. It has also promised to push for the enforcement or implementation of the automatic adjustment formula for utility tariffs every quarter. They also plan to fully remove subsidies on petroleum products and even electricity consumption. The Ministry of Finance will now have to have the final say or approval for any new borrowings for the energy sector. They are also rolling out a new system for billing and metering for water and electricity consumers. It is also working to implement a new tariff and revenue allocation and distribution for all the utility players. All these measures, all these measures which are currently being worked on by government would help open a fresh page when it comes to the finances of players in the energy sector. These sector debts are currently pegged at almost 10 billion Ghana cities. These debts came about as a result of delays in subsidy payments and utility debts of some of the government agencies. And away from energy, the Association of Rural Banks has made a case for an extension of the deadline, citing the tripling of the corporate tax paid by its members, a situation it has already lamented as negatively affecting its operations. The Bank of Ghana has asked financial institutions in the sector to recapitalize in a move to avoid collapse and protect depositors. December this year is the deadline for rural and community banks, as well as other commercial banks, to meet the new minimum capital requirement. Prince Apia has more in this report. The Bank of Ghana last year increased the minimum paid-up capital requirement for rural and community banks to 1 million Ghana cities from 500,000 Ghana cities as at December 2016. According to the Rural and Community Bank's performance report, only 41 out of the 121 rural and community banks have met the requirement. As the December 2017 deadline approaches, some rural and community banks have begun raising concerns about how to meet the requirement. Besides the many concerns, a Memphis Rural Bank is one that has been able to meet the requirement. Dr. Tony Aubin is board chairman. You see, the, like all the banks in Ghana, there are some that are very strong and some that, that are medium and those that are also struggling. So uh, the fact that Amen Fiman and uh, a few others, um, I understand about 40 of us, uh, have uh, the, the basis, we have the capital, and some of us have exceeded, doesn't mean our colleagues must be left behind. If you look at what we do, you know, and our locations, it is not very easy to raise a, the stated capital. It is not, it's not very easy. Uh, you have to work very hard. So whilst appealing to government for, um, for this issue of capital to be extended, I also urge my colleagues, the, the colleagues in other rural banks, to, to up their ante so that, because it's good for you. Chairman of the Association of Rural and Community Banks, Nana Dr. Akua Buama, tells La Business if the central bank don't reconsider, some of its members will go down in the face of increased corporate tax from 8% to 25%. Uh, the banks reaching the one, one, 1 million requirement, then some of our banks will go down. But you can't blame Bank of Ghana. The point is that if you are a depositing taking institution, you also have obligation towards your depositors in case the bank goes down. However, we think that this has to be revisited so that banks that are having problems meeting their capitalization requirement will be given some time more to work on plans of recapitalizing and making sure that they meet the requirement. But the requirement has to be met because we are taking depositors' money. Meanwhile, the regulator of rural and community banks, ARB Apex Bank, 
has rejected calls for extension of the deadline for the sector, uh, the first sector's new recapitalization requirement. Rural banks have till the end of December to meet the new capital requirement of 1 million Ghana cities, which is a 100% increase from the initial 500,000 Ghana cities. Head of the banking, uh, head of banking at ARB Apex Bank, Maso Donko, says struggling rural banks must rather consider mergers with uh, or risk revocation of their licenses. I cannot preempt what uh, Sanctions Bank of Ghana will apply to these banks by 31st December. But it means that Bank of Ghana that gives you license can easily revoke it. So what it means that we have been preaching that banks should consider mergers. I want to advise that if a bank wants to do banking business, capital is crucial. So I would rather encourage, instead of writing for extension or writing for Bank of Ghana to whatever, to either waive it or what, I would advise that if you want to stay in banking business and be competitive, more capital is needed. So banks should be prepared to find ways of raising their capital. Still in the Ashanti region, traders at the Swami and Konfanochi Teaching Hospital runabout are pleading for extension of evacuation date. This follows a statement of notice by the Regional Coordinating Council asking the traders to evacuate these areas due to attendant risks. The evacuation exercise is slated for Monday, November 6. The traders, however, say they have not received any official communication from city authorities. They want the exercise extended till after the Christmas festivity. The traders at the Swami and Konfanochi runabout are pleading for extension of the evacuation date. Now here is the Konfanochi runabout. Behind me, a few meters away, is the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. And over there is the Bantama Market. Now this is how close traders are to the runabout. The dangers it pose to the traders as enormous. And this it's one of the major reasons why the city authorities have decided to evacuate all traders here and other runabouts, such as the Swami runabout, to protect them. Invasion of traders on Konfanochi Teaching Hospital and Swami runabout and other sites in Kumasi has become a matter of grave public concern. The unauthorized occupation is characterized by chaotic scenes and the risk of vehicles potentially running over pedestrians. The least talked about the sanitation implication with huge volumes of refuse the better. All attempts in the past to raid the places of traders had failed, with traders resisting holding city authorities to ransom amid political threats. The original coordinating council was left with no option but to step in to order traders off for safety reasons. As usual, the traders will not go without a fight. Nobody has officially been here to ask us to leave this place. Next month is Christmas. The authority should wait after Christmas because that is when we can make some better money. We shall move, but it is too sudden. In Kumase, it is we the women who take care of the family with this petty trade. Our goods are perishable, and so putting them in the stores won't help us. That is why we sell out here. They should find us another place to go to before they ask us to leave. Yes, we know selling by the roadside is dangerous, but we can't afford the 600 and 800 million worth of stores they are asking us to rent. They should be patient with us. 
The traders are being asked to relocate to the Dumenu, Abinchi and other satellite markets in the metropolis. And it's a wrap on today's edition of the market. Please, thank you so much for your company. My name is Emmanuel Pachin. Yeah, we'll be listening again. See you tomorrow.